I really appreciate it, Coach Grandinetti. Uh, let me share my screen and uh, we'll dive into it. Um, so far, let me think. Am I messing this up? No, you're good. You're good. You just have to make it full screen and we're good. Okay, perfect. Yep. This is a, it's a new deal, right? So it's great. Are we, you can see everything? Yes, sir. Good to go. Okay. All right. Well, uh, hey everybody, I'm John Torrey and I'm, I'm from Denison, Iowa. And I just want to talk a little bit about culture and you might have questions. Uh, this is like a fluid document. This is something I'm working on all the time. Coach Weaver is on the, the, he's in the Zoom meeting too, and Coach Grandinetti also. And uh, big shout out to Coach Grandinetti for just having me on another platform to share with people. I'm a sharer. So anything that's in here is anybody's that wants it. You know, we don't do things perfectly, but it's fluid all the time. And I think those of you that are culture minded on the chat in the Zoom here, you'll understand that. And so we're always looking for ways to make it better, uh, especially with. We were just talking about this last night, Coach Weaver, with our guests that we had on, on the Culture Classroom podcast, is that we're competing now with way more things than, than we ever have before, right? Like we're competing with way more distractions, whether it's video games or friends or people just don't want to do it, or maybe they're specializing in other sports. And so it really is about relationships that we're building. And our culture has to be right in order for people to get our numbers going in the right direction and, and keep serving people. So this is more than the game. And the subtitle is Building Relationships for a Winning Culture. And there you see my contact information at the bottom. And it'll be on the slides as we go. So don't hesitate to screenshot things or uh, you know, ask questions as needed. First of all, I've got to start out every presentation with, it's a great day for football. And that really comes from my seventh grade coach. And I, I honor everybody in my life in a chapter in my book and I've kind of like created this fable and wove it together with based on all the lessons that I've learned along the way. And my seventh grade football coach is now in his eighties and he would start every practice like that. So he'd scream after taking attendance. It's a great day for football, whether it was a great day or not. And so I've been on this culture journey for a long time, even before it was culture. And I'll get into that here in a little bit. And I think as a, English language arts person, because I read a lot, you're going to see that too, and I write every day. But basically, you know, this is the hero's journey. Culture is the hero's journey. You, every year we have a start, you're on an adventure, you meet people that are going to help you, and then you cross the threshold into the unknown, right? So maybe this is camp, it starts out, and this is how we do things in our program, and these are our coaches, and this is what's expected of you. And then all of a sudden that first game hits, and now we're in the underworld. And there's going to be trials and there's going to be failures and you're going to have to grow. And at some point you're going to come out of this thing, but none of us really knows how it's going to be. And I think for us to really lead kids, we have to put ourselves in that hero's mindset and try to challenge the kids to make themselves the hero of their own story. So if you're the JV, you know, if you're playing JV football, what does the hero look like in that story? You're living it. And so I really like this graphic and then it comes full circle because there's a starting point and then there's an ending point because at the end of the day, it's just a game, right? And I know it's more than just a game for us, but from a kid's perspective, they're on to the next thing or onto their next task or, you know, for whatever reason. So I really like this graphic and I think this sums up our mission as leaders to help people uncover their own journey. Here's a little bit about me. Um, I've been blessed to coach everything from youth to the NFL. So I uh, worked for the 49ers before becoming a full-time teacher. And I've been to three Super Bowls. And, and then, you know, uh, the day the 49ers season's over, I'm on a plane and I'm back and I'm in a middle school classroom. And so like, talk about two different worlds, you know, like we're cruising in the NFL, NFL season and then I fly home and then bam, it all comes to a stop. And then, you know, this culture journey. So I, I just finished my 13th year of coaching football and wrestling. And, uh, I've coached golf before, I've coached other sports too. And for a long time, I was kind of dubbed as the player personnel guy. So like, it's basically like if you have a problem or you have an issue or you have a question, well, the head coach doesn't really want to talk to people. So go see Coach Tory. he'll help you out. And so that really became my unofficial title. You know, I coached, coached a lot of different positions all the way from D-line and O-line to DBs and wide receivers to special teams to everywhere in between. Uh, and that's part of me being versatile as we bring guys on our staff or as staffs change, as I've changed jobs too. 
you know, people tap into my skill set in different ways. And I'm comfortable leading a lot of different ways. But it really came down to player personnel. And 10 or 15 years ago, that's kind of a stigma. It's like, oh, gosh, why do I get stuck with all the problems? None of the other coaches have to deal with it. And that's culture, though. So, like, when it, it's almost become a badge of honor. Like, yeah, give it to me. I will help you out. You know, Randy Jackson writes in Culture Defeat Strategy 2 that the most important coach on your coaching staff is your seventh grade coach. Because your seventh grader who's struggling to do all the things and learn the system and they're playing sports competitively and sanctioned by the school for the first time ever, it, it's like they don't know what to do. So your seventh grade coach better have the wherewithal and the patience and the time to dedicate to that seventh grader or that person is not going to play anymore. So that's kind of been my MO is I'm the player personnel guy. I got my master's in coaching in 2016. And uh, my learning doesn't stop there. Eventually, I'd like to pursue a doctorate. But that's kind of down the road. And for the last decade, I've read 70 to 100 different books a year. I actually read 122 last year. But that's more, you know, so I'm, I'm growing in that way, too. And it was when I became a contributor to Pound the Stone. And so I hand out sledgehammers. I've got mine sitting right here at my desk for my guys. Uh, and it's really just a mantra that I've really been able to create an identity around and build around. But I was a contributor to Joshua Medcalf's book, and that's what really got me started on the writing process. Like, I can do this. Why am I not, you know, why am I helping other people do what they need to do when I can sit down and I need to do this for myself? And so that's really when I took writing more seriously. That was in 2016, 2017, following my master's. And then the, probably the greatest endeavor that I've been on in the last year, year and a half, is working with John Weaver, who's in the Zoom as well. And he and I, you know, we co-host the Culture Classroom. And we're currently on season four, finishing season four. We're going to push to season five by the end of the week. And uh, we've run a podcast now for about 15 months. And it's really like a clinic every night. So I never want to get to a point where I feel like I know it all. I never want to get to a point where I feel like I understand everything. Weaver and I talk about how we're maybe just ahead of the curve, you know, because it's always changing. And the minute you think you've arrived, well, that's when everything's going to topple over and you're going to be uh, in the dumps. So that's a little bit about my culture journey and from player personnel all the way to where I am right now. People ask me all the time, what are your favorite books? And I think these are my four favorites. And there's pieces of these throughout more than the game and they've shaped me in different ways. But these are four that if you're really looking and, and you're like, oh, I don't know where to start. And I think that's the other thing with culture is just get started somehow. Do one thing different than what you're doing currently. And it doesn't even have to be very big, but start small and then little by little, those changes will make a difference. So these are four books that I highly recommend uh, that have really shaped my, you know, my thinking and really have helped me evolve from player personnel, like the problems guy into, no, this is how we do things here. And this is, this is our culture. A little bit of history, cause you know, I'm a social studies teacher. Uh, the origin of culture goes all the way back, you know, over 400 years. And it really just means to care, cultivate, and worship. And when I think about football, those are three words that I hope some, my, some of my players will say about me. That I care, that I help cultivate or build, and that, you know, we worship this game of football together. And, and I don't mean in the God sense, but I mean in the sense of there's, it's sacred, right? It's special. It's ingrained in the American culture. and all of that uh, is, is kind of what makes me who I am. That helps me with my DNA. And so I think for our purposes today, if we could look at defining culture, this is how the dictionary defines it. So art and other manifestations, human collectivity, customs, social institutions, achievements. And here's how Randy Jackson defines it. And I like this. It's a little bit better. He says how your team thinks, speaks, and acts. And this is what Coach Weaver and I have really been exploring in the culture classroom is, this is a great conclusion from, from Culture Defeat Strategy 2, which if you haven't picked that up, please go do it. It's, it's amazing. But Randy Jackson says, you will get what you deliberately create. And so I think with culture, we're deliber deliberately creating all the time. And this is just a quick thing. And again, this comes from the culture classroom, Weaver's and my conversations. But it's basically like what culture is, core values, a team language, intentionally building relationships. And culture is not just a quote on the practice plan or a really cool graphic that you put on your weight room wall or 
It's not because I said so, or this is how we've always done it. In fact, kids today, and this comes from uh, Tim Kite, they don't want to be told what to do. They want to be coached through it. Whatever they're doing, they want to be coached. They, they want to figure out the problems themselves, but they need guidance along the way. They don't just want to be told. And so I really like this. This, this really helps simplify and compartmentalize what we're after with culture. This graphic comes from Pound the Stone, and I think that it, it's phenomenal, right? Like we all want to go from here to here, and we want that to go as quick and as smooth as possible, and we want to see that we're making progress. So when it says, what do I want? That's what we want. We want to go in that straight line. In reality, <clears throat> excuse me, how it feels is we're all over the place, right? Like we've seen, we could see this and come watch one of my practices for a two-hour session. You're going to see me do this loop-de-loop. -loop. I'm going to give guys high fives. I might cuss some guys out, you know, like I'm going to be angry. I'm, I'm going to have, I'm going to be dancing on the sidelines a little bit, but this is really how it feels. It's this messy, weird thing. And, you know, it, from moment to moment, and we're living by our emotions. That's really how it feels. And in the end, though, it actually works with small, systematic gains. So taking one thing and making it just a little bit better. And then thinking about what you could do next and making that just a little bit better. And you start to level up. And over years or maybe even decades, all of a sudden, you look at where your program was and where it could be or where it is now and what happened all along the way. You know, it's the saying, Rome wasn't built in a day. The greatest empire in world history wasn't built in one day. And so that's actually how it works. Small, systematic gains over time that take you from where you, where you are to where you want to be. Uh, I came up with this in the shower, actually, a couple months ago, and I've tweaked it, but I, I really feel like this is kind of what culture is. So on one hand, you have to know your organization's history and your traditions, right? Like sport is really good at history and tradition. These are how many playoff appearances we have. These are the things that we do on game day. And then on the other hand is part of our culture has to be your values and your beliefs. So what do you stand for? In Monarch football, we talk about we're going to pound stone. We're going to pound sand, you know, and it doesn't matter. I'm not going to give in. Like, I'm not going to make a difference. It doesn't really matter. But those are the things that, by God, that's what we do in our program. So your values and, and your beliefs. And when you blend those two together, all of a sudden that becomes your culture. Why won't it let me go next? Okay, so then this is kind of the definition that, that we use in Monarch Football. And it's basically culture is how we act, communicate, and how we treat each other. And I think anything that you do in your program is going to fit into one of those three categories. Uh, this is an MVP. We call it our mission, our vision, and our principles. And this kind of came from Brian uh, Kane. And you see on one, I'll give you the Monarch football MVP from a couple years ago. And then the other one is directly from my book. So I know the Monarch football one is a little more jazzed up. It's got the cool graphics. My publisher didn't like that, wouldn't let me do that. But those are kind of there. And I think a lot of people that read my book, the thing that I get the most comments on is, you know, the Titan Tough MVP that's on page 97. Coach Grandinetti. Yes. Uh, uh, do your values change depending on the program and what administrators may want? Great question. Um, our, ours in Monarch football haven't. We've been on this for about seven years now. We've kept some of the same values. We have not been to that, uh, to where they change. But I do think that some programs out there change their values on a regular basis. I'm seeing more programs that take, you know, we're the Monarchs, so they'll take the M and they'll make a, a value and the O and they'll make a value. Or uh, some people will be like the Patriots and the P's of value or whatever. So I think it's up to you, you know, like we're driving the ship. So it's like whatever you want. If you want to change your values every year, that's great. If your administration wants you to change, I mean, I think that's a bigger problem than just your culture. Uh, but, I, you know, I've also seen organizations that they kind of do a God value. You know, uh, it's what Mark Manson, author of Everything is F. Uh, but he kind of talks about a God value, how maybe you have one value that's more important than the others. It's weighted. It's a super value. That's all up to us as the leader to decide. There's no right answer. And I'll get into that here in just a little bit more. I hope that answers your question. I think it could be done either way. I've seen it done either way. I've seen teams that create their values every year using their leadership council. And I've seen programs like us that we've got them defined and we're not changing them.
Um, let me see if I can go to that really quick. And this is kind of, I'll go back for those other slides, but I think this is the slide that really sums it up, is why live by values? First of all, it de-emphasizes winning, right? Because if our value in Monarch football is grit, then I know if my team's gritty or not. We might be really gritty and lose 56 to three. Uh, also, so it de-emphasizes the outcome. Also, it doesn't really matter what's happening in the moment. You know, if we're down 56 to three and our team's freaking out or whatever, it, good example, a few years ago, we got off the bus and it was 21 nothing in the first five minutes of a high school game. Team starts freaking out. And as a leader, you've got your team on the sideline. It's like, okay, push pause, stop it. Our value here is we're committed to the game plan. We're going to go out and it's not going to happen. We're not going to get 21 points on one play. We're going to have to take small systematic steps toward getting that. And so all of a sudden there was like a sense of relief in our players. You could almost see it in their faces where this big burden of 21 points being hung on us in the first few minutes, it, it went away. And it's like, no, we're going to run the ball because that's in our game plan. We're going to throw it here and here to these guys because whatever. But all of a sudden it's like, you push pause and that panic kind of stops. And researchers have found that it actually doesn't matter what your values are. What matters is that you have them. What matters is you've thought about them. You've defined them and you've explicitly explained them to your team. So I hope that answers that question, coach. We're good. Okay. Uh, I'll just show you, so our MVP in Monarch football, and this won't change. So this is something our head coach is very adamant on. It's kind of his that he brought here. And it's just six words. And a good mission should be really quick. Two to seven words, that's what researchers kind of call a tagline. So like if you're thinking about Subway, it's eat fresh, right? Or if you're thinking about McDonald's, it's I'm loving it. Or if it's Nike, it's just do it. So this is our tagline for Monarch Football. This is our mission. We want kids to believe in something bigger than themselves. And the reason I got the little lumberjack guy there is in my book, I talk about how we want to have a sharp ax. We want to constantly be changing and doing things to live out that mission so that we have a sharp ax and we can continue to make games. Our vision, uh, we have a beautiful facility. Maybe it's the best in Western Iowa. Uh, $2.2 million uh, turf and track renovation just a couple years ago. We sit in a bowl. So three quarters of it is in the hill. Um, and on a Friday night in the fall, it's amazing here in Northwest Iowa. But this is our vision. We want to own the bowl. In other words, we want to win every game that we're at home. Every time we're at home, every time we're playing in our bowl, we're going to win. So we're going to own the bowl. Uh, we haven't qualified for the playoffs since 2011. To put that into perspective, our wide receivers coach was the quarterback on that team. And also Brandon Sheriff, uh, who was just franchise tagged by the Redskins, he was our, you know, he was playing in that game as well. So it's been a while since we've had, we've been in the playoffs. Uh, we've gotten really close a couple years ago. We actually just finished back-to-back -back winning seasons for the first time in 15 years here in Denison. So that's still our vision. We still want to own the bowl. We still want to qualify for the playoffs. And if we could ever host a playoff game, it would go nuts here. So that's our vision. And then these are our principles. And we've taken the five things that we've defined, we've matched them to a day of the week, and then we put them with the focus three stuff from uh, Tim Kite. So like press pause, get your mind right, step up, adjust and adapt, uh, adapt and then make a difference. And they go with accountability, toughness, uncommon, commitment, and grit. So those are the things we stand for. And then, you know, social media marketing is so big right now, and you're starting to see that explode, and everybody has Adobe on their computers, right? We all want awesome graphics, and our kids love that. I mean, they, they really do. They crave that kind of attention. So we just use the hashtag ATUCG. Uh, we put it on our helmets. We put it on our T-shirts. We've got it everywhere that you see anything Monarch football. And that's part of our branding that we're trying to do as well. And it's just the acronym for all of our values. So at the end of the day, it's not about win forever, or it's not about some of the other taglines that you see. It is truly about our five values. And our hope is that when our players leave our program, those five values stay with them. Uh, let me go into this a little bit more. So accountability on Monday is we use Monday as the mirror test, okay? So like huddle is our digital mirror. We watch the game from Friday night and we watch the next Friday night's opponent 
and that's our mirror test. You don't always like what the mirror tells you, right? And you have to have the courage to look in the mirror and ask yourself really hard questions. A lot of us don't. Um, I know David Goggins, you know, the author of Can't Hurt Me, he talks about the accountability mirror where you write down your, your goals on a post-it note and slap them to the mirror. And then every day that dirty mirror looks back at you in the face, you know, like you're looking into that dirty mirror to see what's going on. But the cool thing is the mirror doesn't lie. Huddle doesn't lie. You know, how many times have we had an athlete say, oh, coach, I, coach, I, 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 did, I, I did my block and, you know, but it's not my fault. And then you go, oh, wait, no, I've got it right here on my sideline and I'm going to go on the app and, oh, it turns out you didn't. So like the, the digital mirror, it doesn't lie, right? Mirror never lies. And so that's what we want our kids to understand is like, we're not blaming people. It took us a long time to get over that. If I hold you accountable, it, and this is our symbol for accountability, by the way. So like if I see Coach Grant and Eddie on the other side and I know he's not doing what he's supposed to, I'm just going to give him one of these. And all of a sudden it's his visual reminder like, oh man, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to. But it took us a long time to get over that, a, a good five years, because our kids, they felt like that we're attacking them. And, and we're not. It's not about what you're doing. It's what, whatever we have to do to get past what you're doing and do it the right way. So that's kind of where we use the accountability test. Toughness Tuesday, this is probably the biggest change in my coaching career uh, from when I started to where I am now. When I first started, like, I coached the scout team. So it's all about, like, JV guys got a game Monday. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a screw around day for the varsity, right? Like, you're watching a little bit of game film. You go down, throw the ball around, whatever. You don't even put on pads. Um, and then Tuesday comes, and that's when we crank things up. Tuesday's a work day, right? That's how we always looked at it in college. Tuesday, Wednesday, that's our, those are our work days. And so if you're a JV player, you're tired from the night before, your body's sore, but the varsity's not because they've had three days to recover over it, you know, whereas you just had a game last night. And, oh, by the way, now you're running the scout team and you're going in you're playing against the other guys and you're going against our varsity offense and defense. And, uh, you know, what we found with the feed the cats mentality, and if you don't follow any of, of Tony Holler's work, you need to, but we want to feed the cats. And so when you look at like cats in the jungle, big cats, lions, tigers, whatever, like they're either doing two things. They're either chasing animals down and killing them at 100 miles an hour, or they're laying on a rock being lazy. And so when we have Toughness Tuesday, you know, when we started our values, it's kind of like, oh, we need to go. Toughness, toughness. Your JV kids from, night, from Monday night, they're tired, but we, we just got to make them tough. No, that doesn't make kids tough by going against the varsity ones and twos the next day. It makes them injured. And so Toughness Tuesday has really become mental. And so when we talk about mental toughness, that's what we want for Toughness Tuesday. In fact, we don't even wear pads on Tuesday anymore. And then also, it's walk and talk. So we aren't doing anything except you're standing there. And you just have to be mentally tough enough to stand there and listen for 15 or 20 minutes while we put in the offense, put in the defense, put in the scouting report, put in the game plan on the field. It's more of that mental toughness, and that comes from Feed the Cats. Uh, also, I'm the music guy at practice, so the defensive coaches hate it. But, you know, from an offensive standpoint, this is what we do. And uh, I've designed core value playlists. And I know uh, this is something Weaver and I have talked about on the Culture Classroom, too, is like different songs or playlists that we have that fit our core values. So Toughness Tuesday, you're going to see we're going to crank it up a little bit. Uh, and there's just a bunch of different songs that are included on it. Our kids love music and practice, by the way. Um, Wednesday is uncommon. And that's, it's weird. We used to have practice in the morning on uncommon Wednesday, so that kind of made it uncommon. But we're in small town Iowa, and Denison is uncommon. Like, if there's a place that's uncommon, it's, it's Denison, Iowa. Uh, first of all, we're the only high school in Iowa in a town of less than 10,000 people where we have a high school enrollment of over 800 students. And so we're able to make that happen because we're 75% Hispanic and we're 75% free and reduced lunch, 80% in some of our buildings in our district. So our parents come here from all corners of the globe. A couple of years ago, we had about 550 kids in our middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. And we did an activity where we put a map of the world in our commons. And we had every kid identify where they're from, where they were born around the world. And we had something like 306 students born somewhere other than North America. 
So even take out like our, our Mexican uh, residents, our Hispanics, you know, you take them out and all of a sudden it's like, we got people from all corners of the world that end up here in Denison. And what's driving that is we've got two packing plants. So the people that come here, their parents are really hard workers in the factory and they're here because they just want a better life. Now they don't always understand the American lifestyle and they don't always understand sports and what that means, but we're uncommon. So we have to have uncommon solutions to uh, other answers, you know, like other schools in our state, they don't have the same challenges that we do. And with our challenges though, I mean, there's feast and famine as well, but uh, it's really interesting. When I first got here, we had 46 kids out for football. So you think about 800 kids in a high school, let's just say 50% of them are male. So we're down to 400 and we've got 10% that play high school football. One of the ways we've been able to do things with our culture and makes it uncommon too, is now we have over 90 consistently without the freshmen. So we're trying to change that. And again, if kids want to be there, they're going to be there. If you make it fun, they're going to be there. If you don't, if you run them into the ground, they're not coming. And that's one of the things that we've really had to change. Uncommon is one of our themes in Denison. There's nowhere across the state, with maybe a couple exceptions that are close, that looks like we do. Here's our uncommon playlist. And you'll see it's just a lot of songs about champions. Uh, that's the other thing is that our kids, we don't really have a model for anyone who's like, oh, follow this path and this is how you be successful. A lot of our parents, they just want their kids to go work in the factory because that's what they do. So uh, I think sometimes we sell ourselves short. And I think one of our challenges as coaches is we need to pump our kids up. We need to get them to see the bigger things. Like I've been able to go to three Super Bowls. It's really fun to talk about Super Bowls with kids that are still dreaming about it the way that I dreamt about it 25 years ago. And so I think you can do that through song, you know, and uh, you'll see a lot of these are, are like being about being remembered. A lot of them are about being the champion. And so those are just some from our uncommon Wednesday playlist. Thursday's commitment, and you and I, we all know about the value of commitment and uh, how we define commitment. And I know different people have different definitions. Randy Jackson, for example, he'll say what I lay down in traffic for you. And it's a great analogy. Um, our head football coach, he's, he's a national guard. And so, like, we talk about the foxhole. Would I get in a foxhole with you? If things were really going sideways and the crap was really hitting the fan, would I climb in the same hole as you? And our symbol for commitment is to point to our wedding ring. We are all married on our coaching staff. Every one of us coaches more than one high school varsity sport. So that makes it really hard. Like I coach football and wrestling. Uh, our head coach coaches football and track. You know, we've got um, our defensive coordinator coaches football and softball. Our, the guy that I do JV with also, he coaches football and girls basketball and girls golf. So, I mean, we're all busy. We all have multiple contracts. And yet we still are able to stay married. So for us, to our kids, it's about showing commitment by pointing to our wedding ring. And uh, this is how we show commitment. If I didn't have this, I, everything that I stand for would not matter. So that's the message we try to tell our kids. Um, here's our core values for Thursday. It's all about like, you want them to feel good, right? We want them to leave practice on Thursday. And by the way, we've actually shifted morning practice to go from Uncommon Wednesday to Thursday morning. So we're on the field at 6 a.m. on Thursday. It's an hour workout. Uh, and it's all about get them out, get them in, work the game plan, and then let them leave for 36 hours. Let them get away from the game of football and go be teenagers somewhere else. Um, and you'll see it's about planting seeds. So like some of the songs, like Can't Hold Us by Macklemore is a great one. That's a banger, like my kids would say. All I Do Is Win by G DJ Khaled. We want them to get thinking about winning, right? Ain't No Mountain High Enough by Marvin Gaye. Like, we just want to plant that seed of tomorrow we're going to win. Tomorrow it's going to go our way. And when you're in a loser mentality, you never get that message. So th that's, uh, that's our playlist. It's all about don't stop thinking about tomorrow, right? Don't stop from, uh, from Queen. Don't stop me now. Like, those kind of things. I'm Not Afraid by Eminem. And so you really have an hour in the morning. Plus it cranks it up, right? Like the energy level is terrible. Teenagers are terrible at six in the morning as far as like energy and attitude. So if they come in and, and the playlist is going the right way, it's fun to see people's energy pick up. And then that brings us to game day grit. So I write in my book about there's an oyster and a pearl. 
and we talk about it. You know, in Iowa, there's some teams, like, for example, there's this stupid little team 26 miles down the road, and they've played 13 state champ. They won 13 state championships. They played in 26. So to give you a comparison, Iowa has played a state championship game for about 40 years, and they played in 26, and they've won 13. You know, like, it's really hard. That's our main rival 20, 26 miles down the road. Um, that's a pearl, right? Pearls. Pearls are valuable. We get our Sunday best, uh, women wear pearls. Or, you know, when you give a, a girl a promise ring, you're giving her pearls. Um, but the pearl doesn't do anything to earn, right? It just is. It just was created that way. It's actually the oyster, this stupid little shell that's dirty and doesn't do anything, and you just kind of throw them back into the ocean. That's what creates pearls. So oysters will take in a, a fleck of food or sand or whatever, and they'll just keep grinding. And they'll grind and they'll grind over and over for six months at least. Sometimes it can take up to two years. And eventually they protect this, this little thing that they're grinding on. And that's what the pearl is. And then the great part about an oyster is once they've created a pearl, they can do it over and over and over again. And so we tell our kids, don't just be the pearl standing in the sideline, right? Like pearls aren't gritty. In fact, if you drop a pearl, if you scratch a pearl, it's lost all of its value. We want grit. I want people that are grinders. I want the beat up, you know. I want, I want the guys that have mud on their face. And I just think about Teddy Roosevelt's amazing poem of the man in the arena. If you're not familiar with it, go Google it. But it's like, I want the guy, the competitor that's standing there, that he's got dust and blood on his face, and it, it's marred, right? He's, he's got sweat everywhere, and he's continuing to fight. And when I think about a pearl or a, an oyster, that's what I want. So we tell our kids, go be the oyster. Like, Grind out pearl after pearl after pearl after pearl and keep this thing going. And so it's about grit. And again, uh, to take the focus three, it's about stepping up and contributing. And it doesn't matter if you're on the sideline and you're never going to get in the game. You can always do pass ball calls from the sideline. And you're, once you've defined those expectations and those roles, like sometimes it's not about looking good in your uniform. It's about contributing and, and actually doing work. And uh, that's when culture can really, really take off and, and have an impact. We have a creed, uh, and one thing that I want you to notice, I mean, we make our kids accountable for the creed. So for example, we've got one decal on our helmet that's like a super big decal, and on the other side is their, uh, their number. In order to get your super big decal on one side, you've got to know the five values and be able to say those to our head coach. To get the numbers on the other side of your helmet, you have to be able to say the player's creed. And one last thing that I want you to see on the creed is you'll see all five of our values sprinkled in throughout so it's like if you once you get the values this really builds on it we also make a little locker sign and it goes on the player's locker uh throughout the season so that it's a daily reminder it's hanging in our locker room generically also uh, on a big like four by eight banner uh but this really sums up everything that we are uh coach wants to know if you can just uh throw up the slide on the tuesday playlist again absolutely and this is always changing, uh, Toughness Tuesday, there you go. I mean, and it's one of my favorites actually because like who doesn't love Pat Benatar with Hit Me With Your Best Shot, right? Or like who doesn't love Till I Collapse uh, by Eminem? And for you older guys in the room, I mean, Thunderstruck by ACDC, it's amazing. And um, our kids, like we've got an interesting population of kids because we still have some kids that are really country, like weave belts, boots, you know, like cowboy hats, big trucks. And so like, to throw in a little kick a little from Little Texas, uh, that makes their day. So it's not all just about one genre of music or one generation of music. I try to sprinkle in a whole lot to please a lot because when you get 100 people in one area, you're never going to have a playlist that pleases everybody. Are we good, Coach? Yes, sir. Good to go. All right. Uh, our mottos, here's just some mottos we've used in the past. Do it anyway. Uh, Wartburg's wrestling coach has a phenomenal 10 minute video on YouTube. So if you're not familiar with Wartburg wrestling, you need to be. Uh, they've won like 10 NC, you know, like NCAA Division II titles in a row. Uh, they just lost for like the first time this year or whatever. But their whole mantra is do it anyway. Like you're going to do it anyway. And in some ways, it makes my heart churn a little bit because it's kind of that you're going to do it because I told you to. But boy, it's really hard to argue with the success that they've had. Uh, some other ones that we've used are talk with your pads, play with your heart. 
the we is greater than me. And then our motto last year was grind together, shine together. Our seniors are the ones that come up with the motto. So that drives that culture and helps give them voice. We also get little silicon wristbands made up then, and they'll say our values on one side, and then they'll have the team motto on the other. And our kids wear them all the time. I'm big on collecting winning formulas. So like, as I read, I love people that have defined their path, what they want it to look like. And so here's Jimmy Johnson's. It's PA plus E equals P. So it's positive attitude plus effort is your performance. Um, and those of you like Jimmy Johnson, just he's a wild card, but uh, it's amazing some of the work that he's been able to do at Miami and Oklahoma State and then at the Dallas Cowboys and even again with the Miami Dolphins later on. So that's his. Uh, this is from Brad Stolberg, and he's got a book called Peak Performance. It's amazing. And this is kind of that feed the cats mindset of stress plus rest equals growth. So once you put your, your kids through the stress, whether it's mental, whether it's physical, then they need rest. And if you can get those things together, it's growth. I know one of the things we're working on here in Denison is our uh, lowest, our, our minimum dosage, right? Like we want the least amount of stress to get the most amount of rest for our athletes. We want them fast, not tired. Uh, and we don't want them sore. Tired and sore athletes quit. And so that's a formula that I think is, is powerful. Here's another one. Like you've got talent. And then the next level is when you can add hard work in. But really when you achieve the most is when it's talent, hard work, and grit. And grit's one of those things that we can't really measure. We don't really know an impact on an oyster, right? But it's just another formula that I really like. Uh, and by the way, that came from Addison McCaw. He calls it the McCaw method. Uh, and then this is from Scott Frost and Eric Shenander at Nebraska. B Go Big Red, huge season ticket holder and fan. Like my daughter's named Scarlet because Nebraska's colors aren't red and white. They're scarlet and cream. But uh, this is their winning formula. And it's sacks plus takeaways minus explosives equals wins. So I really like how they've compartmentalized that. And those are the things they track. And then here's focus three with culture and strategy. That's what you get when you have execution. And then this is from lead for God's sakes, which was a big part of my master's program, but you've got influence plus two parts of responsibility. And all of a sudden that's when you get leadership. And then this is my winning formula. So you take all those different pieces and you put them together. And this is really what I've come up with. I call it the process of the ship. And it has to be, a, it's a process because you have to start with the R and you, you work your way to the C. And really you don't even care if you ever get to the C. But it's relationships plus leadership equal championships. And I really think it's, it's that simple when it comes to those three things. For example, with relationships, we're building relationships with kids all the time. And the process starts in my seventh grade classroom. A lot of people ask, Coach Story, why do you teach seventh grade? Aren't they weird? Aren't they goofy? You can't even get that much done. They're pretty much like elementary kids. Yeah, you're right. But they're really impressionable still. They care. They want to be around you. You know, they're, a lot of them have been abandoned in their life, at least here in Denison. And so it's like, it starts in my classroom. If I can get them in seventh grade, I don't have four years with them. I actually have six. And that's my main mission. Uh, this is me with my season tickets. I just took a few of, uh, like, that's our quarterback and an old lineman and a wide receiver that are about to graduate here, hopefully, depending on coronavirus. But uh, that's us just going to a really terrible Nebraska game when Nebraska got, you know, worked by Ohio State. But uh, they had fun, and none of us are Husker fans, so, like, other than me. So it's just about sharing the game together, and that starts in seventh grade. We do signing day in eighth grade. I know a lot of other teams do this. Uh, our head coach, his wife is a graphic, like she has her own photo business. So we put some cool graphic together. Uh, this is from a couple years ago. It's got the creed. It's got our values. It, it says we want you to be part of us. Um, we've also go a step farther on orientation day. We put out the big banners like they do on college signing day. And we actually make them sign a letter of intent saying that they're going to play football in the fall. Uh, they get their picture taken with the helmet, the banner. And it, it, it just makes them feel like, Oh, wow, these guys, like, this is really awesome. I want to be a monarch. Um, and then also, we've created an identity. And this is still in the works. We've changed it for the following year for this fall. But basically, 
we're going to call our offense the department of touchdown. And so I've got, you know, like hats, uh, hard hats that I'm handing out. And I know a lot of teams do that. We're going to make players of the week sign the hard hat. We're going to put 20 on it. You know, so it's 2020. This is your team. We're going to retire the hard hat when it's done. Um, and where DOT came from, so you get the hard hat for DOT. And I think this started last year when everyone around us during Timo, our quarterback was really good till he broke his collarbone. Like he's just one of our best athletes that I've ever been blessed to coach. He's the guy on the cover of my book. And we've had this relationship for six years. But whenever he'd throw a ball, it'd be, it just looks pretty going through the air, right? So seven on, and all of our kids would be like, oh, that's a dot. That's a dot. That's a dot, Coach Tory. And so all of a sudden this idea came to us like, let's take the hard hat mentality. Let's take dot, because our kids are familiar with it. They, they get excited about it. And let's turn it into an apartment of touchdown. Um, it also fits in with the pound the stone mentality with the sledgehammer. And then next year, I'm going to give out theater candy to kids too. Because our kids in Denison, dude, they love to eat. So, like, uh, I bought – I had a couple wrestlers go 3-0 and in a night. And I just kind of said – they go, Coach Story, what do we have to do to earn pizza? I don't know. Win all your matches tonight, and, we'll, and I'll get you pizza next day. And they're like, oh, really? It's like, yeah, that's fine. I'll, it's worth 20 bucks if you win all your matches. Well, I didn't think there was any way they did. In fact, they hadn't even won more than three or four going into that. And then all of a sudden, they're motivated. And so it's like they did. They went out and won all their matches. So the next day I buy them pizza. And they, to them, it's the greatest, day, greatest thing in the world. And to me, it's just like, this is great. If it gets you motivated and you're excited, then I'm excited. And so I'll spend 20 bucks on you and we'll all eat pizza together. But our kids love like real food things that they can eat right away. So I'm going to give out little theater candy dots too. Coach, uh, can you just elaborate uh, a little more on the eighth grade signing day? Yeah. Um, so... You know, this is, this is the graphic we give out. Uh, I'll print it out. I'll laminate it. And, again, I'm the point person in the middle school. I hope you all have somebody on your staff who, is, who works in a middle school because I'm recruiting all the time. You know, we talk about, you know, you can recruit on social media. You can recruit whatever. You need to recruit your hallways. So, like, seventh grade, this is, a lot of them are scared. I just go back to my own experience. You know, I was 4'11 and 89 pounds. And I love football, but that is not a football body. And so a lot of people kind of discounted me. They wrote me off, you know, and I don't ever want to do that to a kid. You don't know how a kid's going to grow. And so this is just another piece of engagement. And what I love about it is it's free and it costs me nothing outside of a little bit of time. So I'll take this, I'll put their player name. If they've got a number that they're really attached to, I'm going to put that in there too. I'll print them off. I laminate them and then I hand deliver them. And it goes home with their um, orientation packet. So then it's like, then they go. Then all of a sudden on their orientation list, so as they're walking through their first freshman year of high school, and, and it usually happens about this time of year, sometime in April. But uh, when they go through the high school and they're like, here's your first period math, here's your social studies class, this is, what you're gonna, this is where you're going to take Spanish, whatever. And then all of a sudden they're like, okay, well, when you get all the way through your schedule, I got to stop in the gym. I need my picture taken. And we pub that out on social media. Uh, and kids, it's just free excitement. That's what we're selling, right? We're selling excitement. We're selling, come be part of something bigger than yourself. And if I've got to stroke your ego a little bit to get you to do that, then, then I'm gonna. But um, eighth grade signing day, we've done it for about three years now. And I think about Ed Thomas, who's an Iowa legend. And if you're not familiar with Ed Thomas, I mean, you're talking about a national coach of the year. You're talking about... Um, a guy who sent more players to the NFL than anyone else in Iowa football coaching association uh, history. But, you know, he, he used to go a step farther. He would actually, when a baby was born in his hometown, he would send like a, a draft letter to the parents days after they got home from the hospital. And they said, congratulations, your son. And they, he'd have the name all typed up. And he'd say, has been drafted into the whatever 15 years down the road is draft class for the Applington Parkersburg um, team. And it's just amazing. It's like, you have to be purposeful and you have to think about it, but we, know, we all know orientation's coming. So it's just a, an amazing way for us to create excitement about our program. Uh, Coach wants to know if you guys do anything for shutouts on defense. We do. Um, oh, shutout? Shutouts or shoutouts? Uh, sh uh, shutouts. Um, actually, we don't. Um, I don't think we've ever had a shutout here since I've been here. Um, we were close 
last year. Uh, we beat Heelan 13 to six. We were up 13 to nothing with about two minutes left in the game. Uh, so I'm not sure I'm prepared for that. I think the thing we celebrate is winning. So when, you, when you're somewhere that hasn't won a lot, like shutouts and some of those other things, like, I don't know. I couldn't tell you the last time we had a shutout. So I'm sorry. I, I know that doesn't really answer the question, but it's kind of the world that I'm navigating. Um, here's what we do for defense, though, is we're going to call our team, same thing. It's going to be a dot again, and we're going to call it the department of turnovers. And it goes back to that uh, formula where if you win turnovers, you're going to win ball games. And uh, that mar turnover margin is so important, so critical when it comes down to one or two possession games. And so we're going to be the department of turnovers. Uh, special team is uncommon. And I'll be honest with you, like, it's really hard to get kids to play special teams in, in Denison. Uh, we try to bring in our, you know, tier two players or maybe even our JV guys that it's a good way to get them to see the field. And it just doesn't work out well for us. So this is an area that I feel like has been neglected in our program. And we're working to get past that. But none of us really know what that looks like at this point. So we call our special teams. Our identity is to be uncommon. Uh, you have to be a little uncommon to play special teams. And so we're working on that as well. Um, you know, I call myself our group, the stone cutters. So I coach running backs and we pound the stone and you got these little weird Simpsons things, but my kids know it. They know they're a stone cutter and it stems from the stone cutters credo. And it's just, this is again in pound the stone, but this was by Jacob A. Reese. And he says, when nothing seems to help, I go and I look at a stone cutter hammering away on a rock, perhaps a hundred times without as much of the crack showing in it. Yet at the hundred and first blow, that stone splits in two. And I know it wasn't that blow that did it. It was all the other ones that had gone before. And that's what we're after. You know, when I think about running the ball, I think about you're going to have five-yard gains. You're going to have two-yard losses. You're going to have a fumbled exchange. You're going to have an eight-yard run. And eventually, though, if you keep pounding and pounding and pounding and pounding, you're going to break off that 60-yard touchdown run. So that's kind of where that comes from. I hand out sledgehammers. I put my players' names and numbers on them. You see we've used pound the stone as our motto before for our team. There's the little silicon bracelet I was talking about. And we call ourselves Arby's. I wish we had an Arby's here in town. I would take my running backs to eat every Friday or every Thursday night if I could. But we just call ourselves Arby's. So just something that they, they've created and uh, part of our little subculture within the ATU CG. Oh, by the way, an RPO in my world, and I know Weaver gets tired of hearing me probably talking about this, but – it's just run pissed off. That's what I want with an RPO. Uh, I do SMART goal setting with kids. So SMART is an acronym for specific, measurable, achievable, the results, like what steps are you going to do, and then there's always a time commitment on it. And I sit down with all of my players, and this takes about an hour to do, but we set a season goal, we set an academic goal, we set a long-term goal, and two long-term goals. And then at the end, and it can't just be like, well, I want to make the NFL. Well, that's not happening. So uh, this kid in particular that we're looking at, he's got two long-term goals. He wants to play college football. Well, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. And then secondly, he wants to get his degree. And I think those are really good long-term goals. But at first he was like, I want to make a $5 million contract. I want to sign in the NFL. And it's like, Jaden, everybody else does too. So you have to think, you have to define success outside of that parameter. And then you see that's where the action steps help. Um, and then I sign it with them, and then they sign it too. And then I get a copy, and they get a copy. And we go back, and we look at goals regularly throughout the season. Um, if they're longer-term goals, then I'll send a text or whatever. Uh, and this particular kid, I've done about every six months, we sit down and we reassess his goal. We look at where he was. We kind of think about the steps where it took to get to where he is now. And then we stretch a little bit higher and, and try to keep reaching. So uh, he's actually one of the kids that I've had a great relationship with. And it's weird because he doesn't really have a relationship with anyone else on our coaching staff. And like, that's, those are his words. And that's really scary for me because it's like, I think of our coaching staff as tight knit and unified. And yet here's a kid who's like, well, I trust coach Tory, but I don't really, I don't know about everyone else. And that really puts me in a weird situation sometimes. But I try to speak for what's best from the consensus from our coaching staff. And uh, at the end of the day, Hopefully he knows that we're all committed to helping him get to what he needs. 
but I do goal setting with our kids. If you don't do goal setting, I mean, I think you're missing a huge opportunity to get that, to know them on a personal level. We take our seniors on a summer retreat every year. So this is Inspiration Hills. It's from a couple years ago, but um, they do like a ropes course. So if you've ever done high, high ropes or low ropes, like it's fun. You just see kids in a different light and you take them for a day. And I think we had Subway sandwiches for lunch and we're in the middle. It's a three hour drive or whatever, but uh, we got a school van and then we get them on this ropes course. And it's all these different activities. Like you see the kid balancing himself, with holding the rope on the two by four and his teammates are kind of balancing him too. And a really cool thing happened out of this one is it's just us. And so you see a couple of other coaches in the, in the background, but like our seniors started to say something during this, during this retreat. They used to say, just be the tree. Trees are really strong, right? They can withstand lots of storms. They're grounded. They're not going anywhere. You can brace yourself on a tree. And that really became a theme for us uh, throughout the year. So like on fourth and two, when we call timeout, we're in the red zone. I very much remember in a critical ball game in the fourth quarter, you know, one of our senior, our senior center, he looks at the quarterback and he goes, hey, I'm your tree. I got this. And so that really became a rallying point of be the tree. But in order to have those breakthroughs, you have to get them outside of football. And I know it's another commitment, and it's more time that we ask kids to, to do, uh, and families don't always understand that. But for us as a team, it's just really important that we do those things. So that senior retreat has kind of been a cool tradition that we try to continue every year. Um, I know this is something Weaver has inspired me. My college coach did it, but I didn't really do it till Weaver and I talked about it. And he really challenged me to start writing game day notes to my players. So I do. So I take all of my um, running backs and I, I write just a game day note. And every game day note has three things. One, I talk about how it's an invitation, right? Like or you're, you're excited about what you're doing now. So like, hey, good luck tonight against Storm Lake or whatever. Um, and then it's then I always talk about the challenges they're going to face. I just reaffirm what they've been doing. You know, like you've been working really hard at practice. You deserve this more than a lot of other people. I hope that you can go out and just play really hard tonight. And then lastly, it's about pounding the stone. Like things are not going to go well. So maybe it's being a good teammate. Maybe they're not going to carry the ball all night. So it's like, hey, you know, I'm really proud of you because you've been a good teammate. And tonight, I really need you to have pass ball calls. And I just need you to support your teammates. And, and let's be one together. But I make these game day notes. And at first, when I'm handing them out in the locker room as kids come in, I don't say any words. I just give them their note. Uh, and uh, a lot of times, I thought kids would just, oh, they'll find a trash can. They'll throw it in there. But it's really cool at the end of the night, after they've changed however the game ended up, and they've got their street clothes on, and they're going out to the parking lot, because that's where our kids hang out. It's so weird they hang out in the parking lot after games uh, with their friends in their cars but like they still have their game day notes in their hands that they're going to take home and they're going to give them to their parents uh the other thing that i've noticed too and i do it for wrestling also but i'm starting to see them at graduations now so they'll be out on the table and there's their academic letters and there's their sports stuff and then there's coach tory's game day notes from a couple years ago that he wrote and so that's a really humbling thing and it's like again what does it take five minutes to write a letter to somebody? And so if that's going to make a difference to them uh, if, and if that's going to strengthen the relationship, then that's what I'm going to do. And the last part that I always conclude with is I'm proud of who you are. I'm proud of the man you're becoming. Um, we do uh, relationships as far as like a leadership program. And this is kind of how we keep relationships going in the summer. We take our 76 players from last year and we divided them up amongst eight coaches. And so we had like three leaders and you kind of see our graphic on here. So you got the coach leading these three leaders. And then from those three leaders, they communicate out to the other players uh, that, we're, that are on our team. Um, and players sign up and this model has worked for us because as a coach, I'm not gonna get involved. If my leader is really good, I don't wanna get involved. They don't wanna hear, you need to be in the weight room from me. They need to hear that from their other teammates. And uh, it's only after like someone said, Maybe they've come up with maybe they've something somebody. coming. You jumped up to look a little bit better and seen the ants. So you need to change the answer. Uh, they don't want to hear from me. And so, like, it's only after they've maybe ditched a few workouts that I'll get involved um, and then I'll contact that leader or whatever. But we've had a lot of success going to this. Uh, players sign up. So you see, we just numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They don't know which coach is which. They do, but like, 
we want to ultimately even it out and we open it up to our leadership team first. And so players have choice and they kind of get to be around the people that they feel the most comfortable with. Um, also for relationships when we're in season, every day we start with an energizer. So we celebrate birthdays. We'll uh, gather the whole team on the 10 yard line and we'll spin the birthday person around however many times. And then we ask them to kick a field goal and they never make it, but it's just fun. Uh, we've done dance contests before. I write about that in my book a little bit. Um, we've, we've put trust falls. So we take our 300 pounders and we start on the ground and we do a trust fall back into other people. I've led other schools through a trust fall also. So like via Zoom or whatever. We put our 300 pounders then on a table and we let them fall back into the people. But um, it's just about creating that trust. We've done the, the hero, the hardship, the highlight. That's a John Gordon thing. And then the voice of the warrior I got from PJ Nurbin where uh, we talk about where we came up short. And the important part of that is for us as coaches, we all have this tough facade, right? Like we're, like we're just tough, right? And I think about strength coaches and they're just jacked and they just don't show much emotion and, and whatever. But in order to reach our kids, they have to see where we've fallen. And so the voice of the warrior is kind of like, where have you come up short in your journey as a person or as a player? Where, what, did, what can I learn from you? And it opens you up to be vulnerable. And I know self-disclosure is a big thing, but I really challenge you to be as vulnerable as you can with your players because it, it's what will connect you as humans in the end. So every day we, have, we start our practice with some quick energizer. Uh, so that's relationships. Are there any questions about any of the relationship things? We're good, Coach. Okay. Uh, the next part of the phase then is leadership. And so we created monarchies. Uh, if you don't have your own language yet, I highly encourage you to do it. It's just these are the things that you'll hear from us at any given practice, and these are the things we stand for. So whether it's do it anyway or do your job, I know that's a Bill Belichick thing, or the E plus R equals O, or the BCD, or four to six A to B, or be where your cleats are, or sweep the shed, or even if it's just me saying pound the stone, man. I mean, these are things that our kids know exactly what this means and what they need to do to be successful when we say them. Here's our leadership model. And this kind of came from above the line. If you haven't read Urban Meyer's book, whether you like Urban Meyer or not, I personally don't really like him. Uh, but this is kind of the thing that this is his model. So you see the red line at the bottom? We're above the line. We're going to communicate. We're going to do our job. We're going to love the dirty work. And then you see our other core values sprinkled in throughout. When we were first starting our leadership journey, this was our model we came up with. And it's evolved since then, but I think this is kind of how it all stems and flows from values. I, I want to encourage my team to read eight pages a day. And I know we're asking a lot of kids and they're like, oh, well, they got so many classes that they're in and they have to read anyway. I don't care. Like when I grew up, here was your shelf that you had to read based on your reading level. And these were your five books that the teacher said were really good. And these are what you have to read. We don't do that anymore. We open it up to read anything that you want. And so I'll try to do a book study uh, throughout the season and in the off season. And these are some of my favorites. So the Young Champion's Mind has a lot of great advice. Here it is sitting on my desk. But it's just got like a lot of things about like nutrition or about being anti-fragile or body language the values that we speak into kids, but it's just another platform to give it to them. Uh, if you haven't read Chop Wood, Carry Water, you need to. Um, I don't think there's much proprietary in there from Joshua Medcalf. A lot of that comes from other places, but it's just really good. And then you'll see legacy as we go here a little bit farther. Um, the last part about reading eight pages a day, and I write about it in my book, is this advice was shared with me with a mentor. And it doesn't seem like very much. In fact, I'm reading a lot of research now that says if you want your kids to read at home or if you struggle with reading, keep a book by the toilet. And I know it sounds really weird, especially in the days of the coronavirus, but that's where people will read. And if you read eight pages every single day over the course of a year, you're talking about almost 3,000 pages read by the end. So I think small dose, again, makes a big difference over the long haul. Um, our Leadership Academy, it's part of our 365 days uh, a year plan. It's five weeks long. It takes place in a coach's classroom. We take, it's five weeks because every week is centered on a value. And the outcome of the Leadership Academy that we do 
is to align the coach's goals with what the players want. And we've done this a lot of different ways in the last three or four years. At first, we said it's only open to seniors. And we got like four kids. And then we said, okay, we're going to open up to upperclassmen, juniors or seniors. And we got like eight kids. And then at one point we said, you know what, if you can't commit to all five weeks, then you're not welcome. Then you can't be part of this. And we got even fewer kids. And then the last year, we opened it up to anybody who wants to come from our team. Anybody can come to any session. So you can come to one session. You can come to all five. You can come to three. It doesn't matter. We're not keeping attendance. And all of a sudden, we averaged 38 guys in the room. And so I think the, some of those restraints, the more restraints or the more definitions you try to put on kids, the more pushback you're going to get. Uh, Weaver wants you to uh, talk about the importance of outcomes and meetings. And just real quick, Coach, you got about 10, 15, okay? Okay. Oh, that's great. 10, 15 more minutes? Yes, sir. Great. And Weaver wants me to talk about outcomes? Outcomes and meetings. Yeah. So like The, import, the importance of an outcome in a meeting. So there's nothing more frustrating than going to a meeting, right? And, uh, and you don't really get anything done or you don't really, yeah, like you don't want to be there or you're like, oh, this is a big waste of time. And so it comes back to your values. And we've set out these things. So every time we meet, there's an outcome in mind. So early on in our leadership academy, it's a great question, Weaver, because early on in our leadership academy, it's us pushing the agenda. And you'll see that here in just a moment. And then toward the end, in week four or five, our agenda is over. And we want to get the player's agenda so that we can all reach a consensus together. But you're right. These things are about 30 minutes a week, so it's not even very long. And uh, there's a short video. There's some engagement. And then it's right into our content. And at the end of the day, this is my only time to see them because they're at the high school and I'm not. And so we really got to get something done. So if you're going to have an agenda, then you better have some kind of outcome that's going to make your team better, something tangible that at the end of whatever time you've allotted, we can say, yep, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're moving forward from there. So I hope that answered your question, Weaver, but it's great. I think sometimes we, go, we meet just to meet, and we don't want to do that. You want to meet to drive the behavior. You want to meet to change the outcome. Um, and maybe this will help it a little bit more. Here was the outcomes of our Monarch Leadership Academy from last year. Uh, we, our coaching agenda was Vic Fangio, the head coach of the Broncos, a former head coach of the Broncos, he had this thing called death by inches when he was the DC at the Bears. And it's basically like every time you miss a workout, every time a player comes late, every time that you decide you're going to skip a rep, you are dying. Your program dies a little bit. Those are inches. And so what we decided to do was our leadership academy set this out. And again, we had 38 bodies in the room, small groups working together. We told them about death by inches. Weaver and I did a podcast on this on the culture classroom. And then this is what the kids decided. They said they're going to lift three times a week. They're going to attend speed and agility twice a week because we want to feed the cats, we want faster athletes. And we're going to have 90% of our team that is off the F list and doesn't have a code of conduct. And if you don't lift three times a week, or if you're not lift, getting in speed and agility, or if you're on the F list or the code of contact, those are inches. And so at all the more inches that we accumulate as a team together over the course of the summer, our program dies by that amount. And our kids really bought in. And we exceeded all those things um, for our team last year. We had some kids that had individual inches, but I think our goal for a team was to have five inches or less. And I think we had three. So there was an accountability piece that we, we did. We did some running at the beginning of the season during camp, but it was really lax. And we only had three inches to run for. And so people, were, they were motivated by it. And it makes sense. It's just a tangible way of how are you taking what you do in the spring? What's the outcome that you determine? How are you monitoring that throughout the summer? And what does that ultimately mean for you when you get to be in program? So death by inches. Hopefully that answers Weaver's question. Um, also, this goes into the May meeting. So like our Spring Leadership Academy goes into May. It's player led. And uh, everyone knows the expectations up front. They get tired of listening to me talk. They get tired of listening to our coaching staff talk. These are the players. And you see there's the standards that we created. The 90% eligibility. Uh, the sign up for a coach that you want to be under for the tree, um, the training standard, and then what we expect for like speed and agility. So that was the player contract. Everybody signs it, turns it in, and that meeting is run by players. That is a huge mind shift for us. Instead of the coach telling you what to do, now all of a sudden it's your teammates. 
And then this leadership commitment, uh, this leadership commitment continuum, I use it in my classroom. I'm looking at it right now on my wall, but it's basically like, I want kids that are committed. We want kids to be compelled. I don't want kids that are resistant or reluctant. Those are, that's where your inches are gonna add up. And I think the more visuals you have like this in your program, the easier it is for kids to rally behind. And you can get, to, get in touch with John Weaver or I, and we can get you some of this. Um, you're welcome to anything. I'm a sharer, we're sharers. So like anything that we do, you're welcome to. Um, we also do it during the season. So we start out with an energizer, and then before we hit the field during camp, we start in the library where we've got mental training. We've done Focus 3 in the past. We've done Brian Kane Peak Performance in the past. I've had my own leadership agenda. All the kids get a workbook, and they're working through it together in their position group. And so that's where you kind of see there's a video playing, and the coaches lead their position, um, and that's made a huge difference for us. In fact, some of, the coach, some of the comments from our coaching staff is, boy, what would our team be like if we didn't do the leadership stuff, if we didn't do the mental training? Um, but again, that's part of changing the lose, losing mindset mentality. Uh, we have this philosophy called score first, score last, with a focus on the middle eight. So a lot of times, this is uh, something that we started a few years ago, and it's changed the direction of our team. We want to score first. Uh, so in wrestling, for example, I'm a wrestling guy, the person who scores first is going to win 76% of their matches statistically, no matter how the, the next whatever minutes of the match go. So we want the same mindset in football. So we're going to not defer when we win the coin toss we are going to take the ball. And this has totally changed our team because your plays are scripted, you know what you're gonna run. It's a chance to sell to you guys that look, we're gonna start out with a win. We're gonna start out by getting what we want. If we lose the toss, they're probably gonna defer, we're gonna get the ball. If we win the toss, we're gonna take the ball. Either way, we're looking to score first. And then lastly, we wanna score last. And the middle eight is talking about the four minutes before half and the four minutes right out of half. We need to win those three phases of the game and that will help our team achieve success. So back to the departments of touchdown really quick. Uh, this is what I call the path to the end zone. And this is brand new. We're just looking for it for 2020. But these are our three goals. Um, we've got the 12% rule. So for accountability, we talk about 12%. In 12% of the snaps that we take throughout a game, we want there to be a, a fumble or a turnover or a penalty. So that means our personnel has got to be right, and that means our alignment, our assignment, and effort have to be great. So in 12% of the snaps need to result in one of those things. That means almost 90% of the time we're doing what we need to uh, in order to keep the chains moving. We want to be 45% efficiency on first down, so uh, uh, on offense. So our first down, we want four yards. Second down, we want half the distance. Third and fourth down, the mission is to get the first down. Um, and then we want a next line mentality. And I actually stole this from Weaver, so uh, it's great. But energy and body language, wherever you are on the field, your, your mission is to get to the next line. That will make you uncommon. If you're going down at the 21-yard line, try to get to the 25. And really it comes down to trust, okay? So trust our game plan. Um, trust our goals that we've set out for you. And how I explain to our team of do I trust you or not? It's really simple. Would I give you my credit card? And most of the time the kids can answer it before I even get it out of my mouth. Oh no, don't give it to me, I'll spend money or whatever. But that's another way that we measure trust. They have to trust themselves, they have to trust their teammates, they have to trust them, their coaches. Uh, and then it goes up, it's about going out and, and being gritty, getting the win, hard hat mentality. Take your own lunch pail, you know, pound the stone, those kind of things. So that's the Monarch DOT. Uh, for defense, our goals look a little bit different. And I don't have a really cool graphic yet because our defensive guys are working on this. But we want three big plays or, or less every game. We want to create two plus two on the turnover margin. And we want either four, want a total of four things, either punts or red zone stops throughout the game. Okay, so offensively, we want the 45% efficiency, 12% rule, where 12% of our snaps are fumbles or penalties or whatever. And then we want three big plays on offense. Defense, we're looking at three big, three or less big plays, plus two on the turnover ratio, and then four punts or red zone stops. And then 
When it comes to the uncommon man, the path to the end zone is we want no substitution errors and we want less than 10 minus 10 return yards. So like that, that would be like if a player misreads a bounce of a football, um, if a player fumbles or whatever, you know, like, just negative plays, or if we go and have to track it down or, or whatever else. But we want positive yards on the turnover game. And I'm probably not doing a very good job of explaining that, but uh, those are our path. And, and here's the interesting part, is in the last five years, when we really have developed these things, three goals on each way, uh, each phase of the game, we have defined a big play to be the same. A big play in our program is 20 yards or more. So like offensively, we need three big plays every game defensively we need three plays of less than 20 yards every game and the amazing thing started to happen as we tracked our goals is that if we can hit two of our three goals in two of the three phases of the game that is a win every time every time in the last five years hit two of the three in two of the three phases of the game at least and we'll automatically win and selling that to our kids, all of a sudden there's a metric. It's not just, well, Mr. Torrey says if we score first, we're going to be really – there it is. We played the game on Thursday. Um, coach, you have a question? Uh, just a few more minutes, Coach. Okay, thanks. We played the game on Thursday. This is something I got from my master's program, and it helps us with leadership too. Uh, we'll come out, we'll stretch really quick, and then there you see we go through every scenario they're going to face the next night. Two-point plays, PATs, everything. And, and it always ends with victory trying to funnel that mindset. If you don't do play the game, uh, and I got it from Jerry Campbell, who is my master's professor. I'll share it with you what we do. It's one of my favorite things. Kids love it because it's up-tempo. We're constantly flipping and putting guys on the field, and then it's light. There's no contact. Uh, we do a pregame routine. Joshua Medcalf has the Pound the Stone mixtape. And so we bring our guys into the, the – library before games at five o'clock so kickoffs at seven we bring them in at five we go over film one last time and then we play the pound the stone uh pregame routine we turn off the lights guys lay down on the floor and we start getting that mindset going we start clearing our head of all the other clutter in our life we finish out the week with film study in my room so again i buy pizza for my running backs and because i coach jv i'm not there on mondays when they're doing their mirror test so i want to watch film together with the running backs and we identify five positive plays together and five negative plays that I contribute to our coaching, uh, coaching reel. And the last part of the formula then, and this is a great way to stop Coach Grandinetti, is with the championships. Now, I have no championship rings, okay? I've been in the playoffs twice in my 13 years here in Iowa and none in the seven years that I've been here in Denison. So how do you define success? Again, we've had winning seasons, but you know, whatever. Um, and I love what Joe Ehrman says about this, where it's a 20 year window. We want to look 20 years down the road. And if my kids are good fathers, husbands, um, and they're employable out in the workforce, then I've done my job in 20 years. I've currently got three kids, really two, but the third one is coming uh, once they get his sentencing done that are serving life in prison that I've coached. You know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how you help people that you can't help, but the 20 year window really helps me keep my priorities in line. Um, and whenever I think about Jaden and Rodney and eventually Neil, it's like a 20 year window is so powerful with our platform as a coach. And I want to just share the last couple things. Um, and it's what I've just started is that we do a Jersey legacy now. And this is kind of what I, I put it out on Google form. And it's basically like your Jersey is your legacy. So your number, like I was number 27. Why was I 27? Because Steve Atwater was one of my heroes and I, I was a safety and I want to play as physical as Steve Atwater. And so we started to do this with our kids. Um, so at the, when they're seniors, I give them this Google form. It's basically about how do you want to be remembered? And there's four simple questions that go with it. When did you play football? What number did you choose to wear and why? And why did you select that number? Or how was it maybe given to you? And lastly, what's your favorite story as a monarch? What do you want future monarchs to know that are coming through our program? And my, I just started this last fall, but uh, it's one of those pieces that are going to take us to the next level. And one of the things that I want from this is I eventually want to get as many as I can. And then that way, when we issue jerseys in the fall, it's like, here's your jersey. 
and then here's the packet of history that goes with your jersey. Here's all the other people that have worn number 27 in our program, for example. Um, and I think that will just help us be connected. And we talk about it in the culture classroom in one of our podcasts as well. But that's kind of the, the thing is that no matter what the team does, your jersey is your legacy. And I write in my book how you just want to show up on Friday night and see that someone has number 27. You don't care if they're good, if they make the game winning catch, or you don't care if they fumble the football. Like you just want to see that someone's got your number and that they're part of the team. And so this jersey legacy, I think, is going to be something really cool uh, as I continue to push it and uh, coach here in Denison. And the last thing that I want to leave you with is this is our organizational chart. So um, it starts with being a monarch, and then you see a husband, a father, an engaged citizen. We want you to have a career. Hopefully you're going to some kind of school that you're graduating. And then all the other stuff, state champs, being 1-0 and every week, or being all district, or you know, being the team MVP, all that is small at the bottom. It really comes down to being a monarch, once a monarch, always a monarch, and then your number, uh, and then all the other stuff that goes in there. But when I look at my own career, when I look back on the, you know, however long I do this thing, it's like, this is my organizational chart. Those are what I'm after, and it all comes from being a monarch first. Coach Grandetti, that's what I got. Awesome, man. Hey, can uh, real fast, could you go back to your Thursday schedule? Absolutely. Uh, and of course, uh, like you were saying before, as far as just sharing this PowerPoint, if anybody wants it, that's, that's, that's totally fine. I just have to reach out to you. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you've got my email, you've got my Twitter. Um, uh, you can DM and I'll, I'll send you my text if you want it or whatever, but I have all of this done and, and you see how we organize things too, but um, play the game, you know, like you want them to try to have that muscle memory. You don't want any surprises on Friday night. And this has been really cool. Our kids really, we, we literally stop practice and move everybody to the sideline. And then it's like, okay, kick return, you're up. And it's all on air. That's good stuff. <clears throat> good stuff. Hey, um, Hey, uh, we're actually, you know, obviously the, the culture talks are always, always the best, man. And, and I appreciate you sharing um, this entire PowerPoint. It's, it's, incredible the the amount of time and effort you put into it but um don't worry you know obviously uh you know we're, we're, we talked before so we're going to get uh, him and, and coach Weaver back on next week to do one together in regards to culture so um that'll be really fun so I mean you know obviously we had to kind of wrap it up towards the end but coach will be back on next week uh to talk some more culture man it was awesome it was awesome hey, thanks I really appreciate it I'm a sharer literally any question reach out to me uh be glad to hear from you guys thank you so much Absolutely, Coach. Really appreciate you uh, being on. Um, the next talk, guys, is in 10 minutes. Uh, Coach, uh, Coach McClan, I think, will be on uh, to talk some more inside zone. So we're pumped, man. And, and Coach, once again, I really